13 says this, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. I call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Hey, I don't know what you've gone through this past week, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you that Jesus Christ is worthy of your worship. Okay, that he, he has delivered us, he has given us grace upon grace, and this morning is no different. So we're going to stand together, we're going to pray, and we're going to worship him. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we have, Lord, that you've gathered us together here, Lord, and I pray that as we gather here, that our hearts are set on you, that you would, that you would take away all, of, all possible distractions of this past week and all the things that are coming up this next week. And Lord, in this time together, you would allow us to worship you. And Lord, that, that we would worship you with, with, with our hearts fully open to, to, to your grace, realizing your, your power, your love, how you have saved us. Lord, none of us were worthy of your salvation. And yet you have forgiven us and restored us because you love us. And so, Lord, I thank you for that. I pray that if we can find no other reason to praise you, then we would remember the cross of Jesus, and we would know that you are worthy of our praise. God, thank you so much. I pray that you bless this worship service today as we worship you in song and in your word, and that all that we would do would be for the praise, the fame, the glory of Jesus Christ. We pray it all in his name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, freedom. Good morning. Let's worship together.
Just like a friend There's no
Cause I know you make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see you But I will believe it I will believe it you may doubt and turn You may try
Let's pray together, church. With every breath that I have, I will praise you. Lord, every song I sing, may it be for you. May everything we do honor and glorify you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done and continue to do for us, Lord. We just want to know you and we want to hear your truth and your word, Lord. And we want it to change us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning again. If you have your Bibles, we turn with me uh, in them to Daniel chapter 4. We are continuing a series in the book of Daniel about how to thrive in Babylon. Daniel chapter 4. There was once somebody famously quoted as saying that not even God can sink this ship. That those words were uttered by the captain of the Titanic, Edward John Smith, in the year 1912. That not even God can sink the Titanic. Now, I don't know about you, but if you, whether you've seen the, the movie with Jack and Rose or not, right? Whether you've seen that movie, you know about the Titanic. You know how it hit an iceberg, and you know that ultimately it did sink. Five days after the Titanic left port in England on its, on its maiden uh, journey, five days, it hits an iceberg, and that iceberg creates a 200-foot-long gash in the hull of the Titanic. And within two hours and 40 minutes, the Titanic sunk. In fact, it was such a modern marvel in the year 1912 that the builders of the Titanic, they, those guys said that this ship is practically unsinkable. Oops. Oops. There's something about pride and challenging God. Not even God can sink this ship. There's something about pride and challenging God that always ends badly. And that's true for the Titanic. That's true in the life of Nebuchadnezzar that we'll see this morning and man, that's true in our, li our hearts and lives as well, that there's something about pride and challenging God that always ends badly. You see, you and I as followers of Jesus, we live in Babylon. We live in a world that doesn't conform to us, but that, that demands that we conform to it. And Jesus, and Jesus calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And what happens is, is that we're called to a life of faithfulness. Okay, And being faithful to Jesus means that we walk in humility by the grace of God before the king, the real king, King Jesus. We live a life of humility, and we'll see how that plays out uh, here this morning in Daniel chapter 4. Because again, pride is a poison in our hearts, and Jesus provides a cure. So if you'll stand with me, Daniel chapter 4, we're going to read one verse to start our time together. We're obviously going to look at the entire chapter. So Daniel chapter 4. The very last verse is verse 37, and I love this verse. This is, this is beautiful. Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for, for all of his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Wow. Wow. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this morning we have to gather together to fellowship and to worship, Lord, that really our, the heartbeat of our church and, and our heartbeats as individual believers here this morning is that we want to lift up Jesus, God, that we want to see that in light of all of our brokenness, sin, and weakness, Lord, that you are good, faithful, and you deliver us. And so I pray this morning that as we look at your word, that as we see maybe this poison or this this monster that kind of hides in our hearts lord that we would know that there is healing for that that lord you care about our hearts you care about us and so you invite us again to receive the mercy and grace of jesus god thank you for your faithfulness and for your love and i pray this morning that your word would speak to us it would challenge us in ways that we need to be challenged but lord ultimately it would we would find that there is a healing um, a healing uh, word, a, a, a hopefulness about what we're looking at this morning. So thank you so much. We pray it all in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So here, in week four of our sermon series in Daniel, we're asking how do we live faithfully in this world? I mean, in this world, it's just crazy. It's hostile. It's chaotic. There are a lot of things competing for your attention. And Daniel chapter four shows us the 
the, the importance of humility before King Jesus. And so here's what we got. Here's what I want to show you beginning in verse 1, is that you can know about God and not know God. So as we start in Daniel chapter 4 here this morning, I want you to, I want you to see some. This, this, is, this is just a free side piece of today's message. It's not going to cost you anything extra. Daniel verses 1 to 3, you can know about God, but not know God yourself. There's, now, there's a world of difference there. Now, look at what verse 1 says. It says, that King, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. So what's happening here? Is Nebuchadnezzar a believer? Not yet. But Nebuchadnezzar thinks because he's witnessed the miracle. What did he see? He saw three people go into a fiery furnace, and God delivered them out of that fiery furnace. And so, he, so Nebuchadnezzar's thinking, you know what? If I praise their God too, then God will do good things for me. And you say, well, how do we know he's not a believer yet? Because if you read down in verse 8, Nebuchadnezzar says that the Babylonian gods are still his gods. So in other words, he sees the one true God as a tool to get what he wants, right? And so, but Nebuchadnezzar is saying all the right things here. If Nebuchadnezzar was uh, like the Chris Tomlin of his time, if he was writing Christian songs, all the words here are good, but his heart's not in the right place, right? And so, so he's praising the Lord here, but again, he's still worshiping his other gods. And so Nebuchadnezzar, this is free again, Nebuchadnezzar is showing us something we have to be leery of. And what he's showing us is this, that you can know about the Lord and not personally know the Lord. What's the difference? It's the difference between heaven and hell. Right? So I can tell you, as a as growing up playing basketball, I can tell you a lot of facts about Michael Jordan, but that won't let me into his gated driveway into his home. Right? And so the difference, so I, I don't get access to Michael Jordan because I know facts about him. And I do, right? And so, so, but the same thing is true with Jesus. You, just because we know facts about Jesus does not mean we get access to his home either. And so, so here's the difference. The difference is, is that Nebuchadnezzar had outward, outward exposure to God, but not an inward experience of God. Now, that's different. You can hear things. I mean, we live in a, guys, this is dangerous for us because we live in a Christian-saturated culture right? I mean, there's, there are churches, there are more churches than there are dogs, it seems, right? I mean, like there are, there, we are saturated in a Christian culture around us, and you can hear facts about Jesus, but facts about Jesus don't replace friendship with Jesus, right? Are y'all with me? So, so, so that's a real danger here. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, I think these are the most sobering words of Scripture, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What's the will of God for you in your life? That you believe in Christ, that you know him, that you walk with him, that, that, you experience, that you're changed by his love. So on that day, many more will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare them to you, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So religious platitudes, religious activity, religious acts are not the same thing as a relationship with Jesus, okay? And, I, and you know, when you go to the beach and there's bad weather coming and, they, and the lifeguards throw that red flag on the beach, that's how I'm just throwing the red flag up, okay? I'm just saying, hey, it's better to search our hearts and be like, am I really trusting him, okay? Because Nebuchadnezzar, it is not, not yet anyway, not yet anyway. So there's a, there's, a, there's a redemption story coming. So here we go. Here is where things get wild in Daniel chapter 4. Now, I, what I want to be in the next few minutes for you is, like, is a tour guide, okay? I want to walk you through a crazy dream that happens. I've called it the Dream More Express, and I'm not talking about Dollywood's Dream More, okay? Nebuchadnezzar dreams more. And so he has a second dream, and the second dream is just as crazy as his first dream, 
okay? And so what I want to do is we're going to walk through his dream together. I'm going to point out some things, and then, there, then we're going to hammer home uh, a couple of key foundational realities. So check this out. Let, let's, let's walk through it. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, what it was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. And I saw a dream that made me afraid again, okay? And as I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head had alarmed me. Now, Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm at ease in my palace. Can I just say something? Nebuchadnezzar being at ease is an understatement. That guy has rims on his camels, okay? He's got a multi-camel garage. I mean, this guy is this guy is living large in Babylon, right? I mean, the man doesn't pay taxes, which we're all like, Lord, please, right? So, I mean, he doesn't pay taxes. He's got rims on his camels. He's got a he's got a palace made of gold that would turn that would make Buckingham Palace look like a playground at Chick-fil-A. Right? I mean, this guy's got every, he's got a 400 foot waterfall off his back deck. I mean, we're talking about at ease. I mean, there couldn't, it, it can't get any easier in life for Nebuchadnezzar. It can't get any easier than this for him. And yet, no one can touch Neb. Nobody can get to Nebuchadnezzar except God, and God does it through a dream. And thankfully, Daniel's there. Nebuchadnezzar trusts Daniel because he says that, Daniel, you have the spirit of the, of the holy gods. In other words, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You're different, Daniel. I trust you. So he has another dream, and it unsettles Nebuchadnezzar. Now, check out the dream, verse 11. The tree grew. There's a tree in the middle of the earth. covers the whole earth. It grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven, and it, it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Verse 12, it le its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it th there was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. So Nebuchadnezzar says, I see a tree, and this tree is growing, and it's covering the earth. And that as the tree is growing and covering the earth, there came a messenger from heaven. And look at verse 14. It says, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from underneath it and the birds from its branches. Verse 15, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth and let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. Verse 17, he goes on to say, the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and he gives it to whom he will and he sets it over the lowliest of men. So you had dreams, right? Again, you know, we, we've talked about this. You dream about going to Cabo. You have, you have a nice 401k. You, you can't wait. You, know, you see the finish line of retirement, and you've got all these plans. Uh, maybe you dream about the things that you would like to experience with your family. You'd like to go to the Grand Canyon, or you'd like to f travel the world, or you'd like to what, fill in the blank. You want the house with the white picket fence. Fill in the blank. You have dreams. You don't have a dream like this, though. This is an unusual dream. This is a kind of dream that you would say a sociopath would dream. This is something that you don't, it's, you just don't think up or, you know, you know, this is something that you don't, um, what could influence this type of dream? Well, obviously it's given from God, but what does it mean? That, this is what's important. Look at verse 19. What does it mean? It says, then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was dismayed for a while and his thoughts alarmed him. He was dismayed. He was sad. He was sad at Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Then the king answered and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. And he answered and said, my Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. Now, we're stopping the tram here for a moment. Let me point something out to you. Okay, on your right, you see Daniel, right? Da here Daniel is. And Daniel has some unusual emotion here. Daniel, it, it looks like that he has learned to love Nebuchadnezzar. The, the same king who's mentioned 90 times in Scripture, all of them are re a reference to evil. So wait a second. Daniel has come to love the enemy that's enslaved him in Babylon. Now, 
Dan, you got to remember, in Daniel chapter 4, they've been in, in Babylon for 30 years. For 30 years, they've been, for three decades, they've been in Babylon. Daniel got there when he was a teenager, 15, 16 years old maybe, and now he's 45 or 50 years old. And he doesn't approve of Nebuchadnezzar's policies. He doesn't like what he stands for, but person to person, Daniel cares about him. He, lo- he has grown to love him. Jeremiah 29 says to make home in Bab- to make to build a house in Babylon and to seek the good of the city to be a blessing to its inhabitants. So Daniel's grown to love him. Why? Because Jesus says to love your neighbors and your enemies. Now who now now who fits in the category of neighbor and enemy? Everybody. Whether you like them or whether you don't, they 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 were called to love them. And, you, and, and, and oftentimes, it's easy for us, uh, maybe in our, in our flesh, we say things like, man, it's just hard to love our enemies. It is hard to love our enemies. But you know what? God loved us while we were his enemy. He sent his son Jesus to rescue us, to bring us out of darkness and in, in, into his light. So God can give, God has the grace that you need to love people too. Okay? And so... The call is to be a good citizen, so we vote our conscience, we work for the good of life and liberty, and whatever happens afterwards, that falls in the hands of, of, of Jesus, that God is sovereign over the kingdoms of the earth. Daniel can't change his circumstance, so what, so what does Daniel do? Daniel learns to love in the midst of it. Hey, I'm going to be faithful. I can't change living in Babylon. This world is crazy. I can't change this world by myself. But you know what I can do? I can be faithful to the Lord, and I can love people. And that's what he does. Okay, so Daniel knows the dream is difficult. He knows it. It means bad things for Nebuchadnezzar. And and he and he says, Nebuchadnezzar, I love you. I care about you. I've grown to have some compassion for you. I wish that what was about to happen would happen to your enemies and not you. Uh Oh, so it's a bad dream. Check this out. So the tree grows, becomes big and strong, covers the earth. And he says, Daniel says, that tree is you. That tree is you. Look at verse 22. It is you, O king. Who have, who have grown and become strong. Now, now, that, now, that's cool. We like that. You can cut, that, you can cut that, that interpretation off. Hey, hey, Dustin, you've grown big and strong. You're right, I have. You're absolutely, totally right, I have. Looking in the mirror, looking good. Everything's lining up like I want it to. Got the portfolio. I got the bank account. I've got the fame. I've got the women. I've got all the things that I want in life. I mean, here I am. You're right, big and strong. Absolutely, Daniel. You are correct, sir. Right? I mean, hey, you, you cut that off. But, but that's not the end of the story. Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens. Yes. Huh? Fame. People know my name. Right? And you have dominion. You have power. You have authority over the ends of the earth. But. But. God has decreed from heaven that like this tree, you'll be chopped down. Verse 25, you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whom he wills. And and as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. So Daniel goes on and he pleads with Nebuchadnezzar and he says, Nebuchadnezzar, if you would, you, we can avoid this if you, would just, if you would surrender your life to the Lord. It doesn't have to be this way. Look at what he says, verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. In other words, hey, I, I'm, I, I need, will you please turn your life over to God? Will you please repent? Will you please confess your sins? Will you, will you please trust him? He says, break off your sins by practicing righteousness and let your iniquities be shown, let your iniquity in your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may be perhaps a lengthening of your prosperity. So Daniel, you're the king of so Nebuchadnezzar, you're the king of Babylon. Daniel says, God has propped you up and made you great. You are the empire in the middle of the world stage. You have been abundant, you are fruitful, and yet you'll be cut down for seven years, so you will know who's in control. And it's not you. Let me ask you a question. 
here we are reading Daniel chapter 4 as, as followers of Jesus, and we're asking, why in the world would God give, Dan, uh, give, give Nebuchadnezzar this dream? And why, what in the world does it matter for me today? Here, here's the answer. It's to alert you. It's to put the red flag up on the beach of the deadly poison of pride in our hearts. Now, check this out. Here's what we see in verse 28. Pride is the problem behind our problems. You've got a lot of problems in life. I, you, I mean, I don't have to know every detail of your story. You have sins, weaknesses, and sufferings, just like I do. That you are just as much of, you're, you're a human being in need of the redemptive grace of Jesus, just like I am. And so, so we all, so I, the details of our situation or our circumstances or our, maybe some, maybe some besetting problems that I deal with, those may look a little different. The details may be rearranged differently, but overall, there's a lot of overlap that you, our problems are really the same. And so, and what's underneath a lot of the problem is pride. It, pride is the problem behind the rest of our problems. Look at verse 29. At the end of 12 months, Nebuchadnezzar was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and, and, and the king answered and said, oh, the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? You know what's incredible about this, about those verses? Is that God gave Nebuchadnezzar a clear warning and gave him not one month, not one week, not six months, not eight months, gave him a year, a year. You know what I love about the grace and the mercy of Jesus is that he is so compassionate to our weakness that he gives you a warning and he waits for your response. I mean, he's so patient and long-suffering, isn't he? I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, there are a lot of moments in my life I can look back and go, man, you know what? The Lord had every right just to zap me off the earth right there. He should have just, he should have just, he should have just taken me out of this place. And he doesn't. Why? He's so patient and long-suffering. 12 months, Nebuchadnezzar, you had 12 months to think about this dream, and you said, no, thanks, God. Instead, he walks up and he goes, man, you see this kingdom of gold that I've built? It's mine. It's, 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 it's a house for my glory. It's all about me, me, me. That's what Nebuchadnezzar does. So instead of repentance, Nebuchadnezzar chooses defiance. Look at what I've built. Look, look at this is my life. This is my kingdom. I'm the man. I'm in control. I'm wise. I'm powerful. I'm glorious. I deserve to be worshiped. So, what does God do? God does exactly what he promises. Verse 31 While the words were still in the king's mouth, can you imagine? I mean, Nebuchadnezzar has, is, has, is singing a chorus of his own praise. And as he's talking about himself in the middle, of him bragging on himself, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And immediately the word was fulfilled, verse 33. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet from the dew of heaven until his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers. And his nails were like bird's claws. Now, if you have a... Boy in middle school, middle school entering into puberty, okay, a lot of stank, a lot of dirty nails, a lot of greasy hair, a lot of sweat, not a lot of cleanliness, right? So Nebuchadnezzar is going through a real transformation here, and it's not the kind of transformation that you want. Nebuchadnezzar here is going backwards. He has crossed the line in the sand. God said enough was enough. And so seven years, that's symbolic for saying as long as it takes Nebuchadnezzar to realize that Nebuchadnezzar lives as something less than human. 
There are no manicures. There are no haircuts. There are no T-bone steaks. Can you imagine life without steak? Or a haircut, right? I mean, I mean, like, I mean, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is Nebuchadnezzar here is is he goes insane and he loses everything in his life thanks to the poison of pride in his own heart. Here's what I believe. I believe that pride is the source of many of our problems. Okay? So let's just get real. Like there, this is this is not, this is not, I'm putting myself here too, right? I'm on, I'm on we're all, the, the the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Okay, and so this is for everybody. I believe that pride is the source of many of our problems. Pride is the sin behind our sins. You know, it's, if you ever, as you're reading through the Bible, stop and take account of how much the Bible talks about pride. You ever heard the expression "pride goes before the fall"? Proverbs sixteen eighteen: Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. So let me clue us in on something here: the pride and fall of Nebuchadnezzar is not about Nebuchadnezzar. It's a loving, strong warning to us because in this story, we are Nebuchadnezzar. That it's easy to lift ourselves up and build our little kingdoms, and we don't want to hand the reins over to Jesus either. And so that's what sin does in our heart. Can I give you a definition of pride? Pride is ultimately putting myself in God's place. That's what what pride is. If we boil it down, pride is ultimately me substituting myself for God's place. So as the creator sustainer and savior jesus should be at the center he is at the centerpiece of the universe but he should be at the centerpiece of our lives but pride is the sin behind all other sins and it says that my life is about me my money is my my money is is it belongs to me sex is about me my addiction problem that's about me that my my business uh my business tactics and ethics those things are all about me they support me that's what i want See, we, we substitute ourselves at the center of our universe, okay? And we believe that we're at the center of our lives. We're the captain of our own fate. We are the, we are the godlike center of our little universes. That's exactly what Adam and Eve do, isn't it, in the Garden of Eden? Hey, they, they disobey God's one rule about eating a fruit from one tree because in their minds, they think they know better than God. You know what that is? Pride. And so... That's what we do. We substitute God out, and we put ourselves in. And like Nebuchadnezzar, my kingdom, look at what I've built. And without the grace of Jesus, this is us if we're not careful. So let me talk about for a few moments about pride, and then we'll get on to some, something hopeful. So pride's roots run deep. So there are two roots of pride that I want you to see here. So one root or cause of pride is that you don't appreciate that your blessings come from God. So, so, so where, where's the pride coming from? It comes from either you can't see it or you fail to actually acknowledge it, but it comes from a failure to realize that everything you have in your life is a gift. And when you don't see the things in your life as a gift from God, it's easy to become proud. That Nebuchadnezzar... Everything he has, everything you have here this morning is given to you by God. The ability, your family, your health, the ability you have to work, the, your capacity to love, your ability to live, the salvation that you enjoy by the grace of Jesus, it's all a gift from God. We are not self-made people. We're not self-made people. If we will slow down and just be real, and that's what we're, that's what, as, Christian, as Christians, we are freed up just to get real. We can be real. about. We can be honest about our own sins and shortcomings and weaknesses. If we were to get honest you, and slow down, we would see the, the factors of your success in life are outside of your control. You didn't choose the family you were born into. You didn't, you, uh, you know, you, you didn't, you didn't create the opportunity for ed, for the education you had for, on your own. You didn't get, you didn't uh, choose or influence the influences that inspire you. You didn't conjure up the right set of circumstances to make your life good or comfortable or whatever it may be. That all, that everything you have is a gift from Jesus, and pride pride fails to acknowledge that. 
But the second root of pride is that you assume that the life that you build for yourself will last forever. That my good life will always be good. That what I've built, that'll carry on. That, that what I want, what I have chosen, what I invest my time in, my little good life, my little kingdom, that will last forever. You know, and say that there are maybe no more than five people who had the wealth and the fame and the influence that Nebuchadnezzar had in human history. I mean, this guy, when, when we're, he is the 1% of the 1%. Okay, he is the one percent of the one percent palace, 400 foot waterfall, the city decked out in gold. If anybody felt secure about their future, it was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm unsinkable like the Titanic. I'm untouchable. God can't sink this ship. And yet God reminds us that this life is not forever, that you have a bad diagnosis Maybe a loved one walks out on your life and you can't stop them. You can't bring them back. There's a mental illness beyond your control. Like we've seen this past week, maybe a hurricane devastates your home and your livelihood. And, 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 and you've got nowhere to go back to and you've got to rebuild. Okay, I read earlier this, earlier this week that the stock market took a downturn and lost nine trillion dollars of, uh, of American wealth. Trillion with a T. Trillion. Nine trillion dollars of American investment and wealth lost in a day at the stock market this past week. That's more than the United States has in its federal reserve. What am I telling you? Is that the life that you think you're building for yourself will not last like you think it will. It won't make it like that. The things that are not built upon Jesus will not stand. And that's what we got to see here, is that it's not permanent. Without God, nothing is permanent. And pride gets us to believe that lie. That, man, I, I mean, I, I've set myself up for, for, for future success. I'm in control. I've got it. I've got the resources. I've got the knowledge. I, 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 am, I am steering this ship. So it's got some root, but here it's also got some fruits in our lives. Now, I want you to check this out. The first fruit of pride is, is unhealthy, unhealthy, an unhealthy competitiveness. You know, as a man, I appreciate a good, healthy level of competition. And I, I'm willing to bet you do, you do too. Whether it's sports or school or shooting archery or guns or whatever, you know, you, you have a healthy level of good, hearty competition, and at the end of the day, you shake hands and you go on, right? But... When I cannot appreciate or enjoy or be happy for somebody else, that's pride rearing its ugly head. Why, can't, why shouldn't I be happy about your pay raise? Why shouldn't I be happy about the fact that your truck's a little bit bigger than mine? I mean, I, I pulled in the parking lot, and we have like four or five Ford trucks early this morning just lined up, and I thought, here I am, it's my, my Tacoma. Now, my Tacoma's awesome, but... I mean, I love it, right? It's the pastor mobile, okay, as, as somebody called it. So, I mean, like, I love that thing. Cool. I mean, I'm a big Tacoma guy. But, I mean, and so I thought, here are these, you know, four-door, big, American-built Ford trucks, right? And I pull in a parking lot, and I go, wait a second. Hey, my truck counts too, okay? And so what, what is that, right? Hey, it's a little bit of... A little bit of pride, a little bit of unhealthy jealousy coming out, right? Oh, yeah, it's cool. It's cool that you got to harvest a really nice buck, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I, last year I got to harvest a really nice one, too. It was probably a little bit nicer than yours. And, and uh, you know, and that's okay. It provided more meat for my family, and my freezer's still kind of full. And, you know, so it's kind of like, what is that, right? That's just, that's just pride coming out, isn't it? Right? That's what it does. That's how it looks. That's how it sounds, Right? It's, just, it's in, a lot of insecurity, a lot of jealousy, a lot of unhealthy competition there. Right? So a second fruit of pride is that pride makes you ungrateful. Right? So gratitude is a sign of humility because you say, wait a second, all that I've got is a gift, and I don't deserve it. I'm thankful. Man, my salvation, my health, my kids, my friends, I'm a blessed man. I'm thankful. But, but when you're proud, you become ungrateful. But also the twin brother of that is that you, you have a third fruit, and that's an entitlement mentality. I deserve this good thing. Look at what I've done. I deserve more appreciation. I deserve more money. I deserve to have a better marriage. I deserve to get a break. And when things go wrong in life, I don't deserve this. 
That's not fair. This shouldn't happen to me. This isn't right. And humility says, that's pride. Humility says, man, it's all mercy. It's just everything. It's just mercy. Maybe the Lord's trying to teach me something through this. Maybe God's producing something good in my life. That everything I've got is mercy. I'm so thankful. And, 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 and even if things aren't going like I want them to, man, maybe the Lord is using it to transform me. And he does. So, so pride has an entitlement mentality. But also pride makes you foolish in your mind. You know, Nebuchadnezzar went insane for a while. Insane. You know what pride does? It makes you insane. That you, you, you become high on yourself and you're overconfident. That, that you forget that life is fragile. It's like a vapor. So you, you take things for granted. You, you, you may think that you, you, you get through life on your own strength and your own wisdom. And yet another king, another wealthy king, King Solomon, says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. So we realize, so pride says, again, it, it, it's, it, it's stinking thinking is what pride is. It, it creates a foolishness up here. Uh, it blinds us to some realities. But, but it's not that I am self-made, that I am strong, that I am wise. It's that I can, I, can, I can do what I do because God supplies me the strength. Uh, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it's not me, but pride gets you to believe that, Right? But instead, it's like humility says, hey, man, if it wasn't for God and his unlimited resources in heaven, I wouldn't be here. That's what humility says. And so let me give you a final fruit of pride here. And, and, and the, the last fruit of pride is that it ultimately destroys your life. You know, when you, think that you, when you say that you're always right, that you're always in charge, you can't ask forgiveness from your spouse, or you can't ask forgiveness from your kids, or you can't show compassion, or you don't show mercy, you're not more generous, everything's about you, everything is my way or the highway, here's what that does, is it tears apart your marriage, it tears apart, it compromises your business success, it pushes your kids away from you to where they don't want to have anything to do with you, it, uh, it turns people into subjects instead of friends, it, inwardly, you grow more irritable because I'm irritable because who are you to question me? Uh, then it, when you become irritable and you start pushing people away, you begin to self-isolate. I'm always right. People don't see it my way. And you begin to withdraw yourself because you think that only you are correct in, the, in, in that equation. What happens is, is your heart becomes hard. Pride is the poison that erodes every good thing in your life. It kills you, especially spiritually. That God, it said James 4, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So wait, so even, so God closes off spiritual access to him. Why? Because of pride. Why? Because you can't worship God and be your own God. That's a problem. And, and so you're going, man, Dustin, this is, Daniel 4, this is a tough word. This is kind of, this is, this is a bit stepping on my toes here. And it is a tough word because the spirit of Babylon is a spirit of pride and it wants to overthrow your heart. And that's one reason why Proverbs 4 says to guard your heart with what? With prayer and worship and fellowship and the truth of God's word. We got to guard our hearts. Why? Because if we don't, then we start to believe, we start to buy some lies. And eventually it'll destroy and decay some things in your life as well. And so pride deceives image bearers into thinking that we're God ourselves. We're image bearers of God meant to worship God, and pride says you're actually God yourself. And it makes you foolish. It, may, it reduces you to less than what God has for you in Jesus. It strips away all of those things. Now, is there a cure? Man, absolutely. It is not all sad singing here in Daniel 4. Absolutely. Is there a cure? The same cure that God gives to Nebuchadnezzar, God offers you today. And here it is, verse 34. Jesus humbles you in order to heal you. You know where healing comes from? Often it comes from being humbled. It, it comes from getting to a place of desperation where all you can do is look up at him. That's where healing comes from. Now look at verse 34. At the end of the days, that seven-time period, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, check it, check it, look at it, lifted my eyes to heaven. And look at what happens when he looks up to the, to the true king. And my reason returned to me. 
Healing comes to Nebuchadnezzar and his pride. Look at how I lifted my eyes to heaven. What is pride? Pride is me looking down on other people. And when I'm looking down at everybody else, I fail to see who's above me. Isn't that right? Can you look down and up at the same time? Unless you're like a, one of those chameleon deals, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you can't, right? And so, and so pride fails to see who's above you. At his peak, Nebuchadnezzar walks out on his balcony, looks at Babylon, and he's looking down, and he's saying, man, look at how impressive this is. And the truth is, is he forgets that the Lord is looking down on him. You, and so you don't, you, you don't become humble by focusing on being humble. You, you become humble by looking up at Jesus, by looking up at him. When you know your place in his world, it humbles you. It puts things in proper perspective. That you begin to say, God is great, not me. And so look at this. Look at what he says, verse 34. And I blessed the Most High God, and I praised and honored him who lives forever. And for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. In other words, the Lord is forever. What he builds is permanent. He is eternal. My life here is temporary. Uh, Mark Twain once said, the world will lament you for an hour, but it forgets you forever. That's us, right? But Jesus his kingdom, that's always going to be around. His reign, his wisdom, his power, that's never going away. It's never going away. So the kingdoms of the world, God raises them up and he tears them down. But his kingdom never fails. His kingdom endures. And only what the Lord builds in your life will last. That's what will really last. And so look at verse 35. And he's singing this song again. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. So God is not impressed with Babylon. God is not impressed with the Roman Empire. God is not impressed with America. He is not wowed by me. He's not wowed by my talents. He's not wowed by my money. He is greater than every single thing in this world put together. He's greater than the world that he created. And so, so look at what else he says. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. So, what, so big picture, Nebuchadnezzar finally sees that Jesus is in full control of human history. From commanding the armies of, uh, of heaven to overseeing the smallest molecules of DNA, Jesus Christ is in charge. Nothing, hey guys, Nothing has gone off the rails in this world. Nothing is beyond his control. Nothing, ha nothing is outside of his ability. Then, and nothing ever will be. Not a sparrow falls from the sky without his permission, and not a hair falls from your head without his permission. He rules over things that we see and things that we don't see. And, and verse 35 continues on, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? I love that verse because it reminds us that God always, always, always accomplishes his purposes. What God chooses to do cannot, cannot, cannot ever by anybody ever be stopped. And if you believe that, then if you, if you don't believe that, then maybe your, God, the, your, your vision of God is too small. But nobody can stay his hand, not even the great king of Babylon. God, God, doesn't, God doesn't have to, God doesn't recognize his authority that way. So what God chooses to do, what he declares to do, it comes to pass, and, and nobody can persuade him otherwise. His power is irresistible. He is never frustrated. Man, you, I, you, I mean, before you go to bed tonight, you're going to be frustrated at something. You go to Cracker Barrel for lunch, and it'll be an hour and a half wait, right? And you're in the little rocking chair, and it's cooler weather, thank the Lord. It, cooler weather's arriving, and, you, and maybe you didn't dress well for it, and you didn't realize you'd be waiting outside, and it's an hour and a half, and only 15 minutes have passed by, and you get a little frustrated, right? And so, but Jesus is never frustrated. Why? Because it always goes according to his plan. Everything does. Everything does. It goes according to his plan. So it doesn't matter what Washington, D.C., or Hollywood, or Satan, or me, none of these inputs matter. No one can stop him, and what he does is right and true. 
always. Look at how he wraps up this little song. Look at what he says here in verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for, the gl- and for the glory and of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in the kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. So God restores Nebuchadnezzar. You know what Nebuchadnezzar found in his period of being humbled? He found the grace of God. That God wants to heal you of all the things that ail you, all the problems, all the weaknesses. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to bind you up. He wants to heal you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to restore you. He is not looking at bringing the heavenly hammer and crushing you. If he brings the heavenly hammer down, it looks like in your life, it's not meant to destroy you. It's meant to build you. It's meant to rebuild you stronger, more dependent upon him, greater faith. It's meant to transform your character in Christ. And so Nebuchadnezzar finds the grace of God. Again, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Nebuchadnezzar becomes humble. What does he find? Grace. Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all of his works are right and and just. It's amazing that you can go through a period of being brought low, and I mean it hurts. It hurts to lose things. It it hurts to to be pushed away, and and it hurts to to work so hard and, and have life fall apart on you. It hurts. It hurts. But you know that you're in, a, you're, you're in a, a, a good place of humility and faith when you can say, that was right. That was good. I needed that. For all of his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. So God is right. I am wrong. He's the real king. I'm going to honor and praise him as the real king. The cure, the cure to the cancer of pride comes through God humbling us. And the Lord humbles us not to hurt us, but to heal us, to help us. And so what Nebuchadnezzar goes through, that is for his ultimate good. And what you are going through, though you don't like it, though you don't understand it, though you're not sure about it, that what you're going through ultimately is meant to help you in some way. Now, you don't see it. Now, you're you're like me, you're analytical. You put all the you want all the numbers on a spreadsheet. You want to see all the facts. You want all the data, and you're trying to make connections. Well, that makes sense. Maybe that's why this is happening. And and there are times God does not give that to you, and yet and yet I know that big picture it's for my good. Why? Because He loves me. He loves me. So may, it, it may hurt for a season. It may hurt for a moment. But there's healing coming. That's who he is. That's what he does. So God strips away some of the excess in life, and he puts you in a place where, it, where you're forced to keep looking up at him. And it's left alone we look down too often. What did John the Baptist say? He must increase, and I must decrease. Our thoughts about Jesus must increase. Our thoughts of him must increase. Our talking to him must increase. Are talking about him must increase. Jesus is the true king of heaven. There's no one greater than him. There's no greater savior. There's no greater healer. There's no greater friend than Jesus. Our, your heart is made for a steady diet of the grace and glory of Jesus Christ. That's what you're made for. Your heart is a, is your heart when you come to Christ and you Repent of your sin. He takes all of the junk, all of the sin out of the container of your heart, and that empty vessel then is filled with the glory and grace of Jesus. That's who you, that's what you're made for. You were made to experience and enjoy the grace and the lavish love of God. And so our hearts need that we, it is healthy. It's healthy for us to be on our knees looking up at Jesus and going, man, Jesus, I need you. Thank you. You're all I have. You're all I need. You always come through. You're faithful. You're good. That that is good for our hearts. That's good for us. C.S. Lewis said, true humility is not thinking less of yourself. You don't have to walk around and dog yourself. It's It's not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. 
So instead of being consumed about me, what if I feel the void thinking about Jesus and his cross and his resurrection and his, 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 him, the fact that he leads me, the fact that right now in heaven he's praying for me. How about, how, how about the fact that he's protecting me? He's working all things for good in my life. The spotlight's on Jesus. And when we have that proper, pr- proper perspective, we see my rightful place, we see his rightful place, and, we, and we're able to walk in humility. We go, wait a second, here I am. God loves me. I'm very small, though, but I'm important. I'm small, and the Lord has set his covenant love on me. J- Jesus died and shed his blood for me. He rose again from the grave for me, and he, he wants me. He wants me to know him. He wants me to walk, in, walk with him a- in, in this relationship. And when we have that proper perspective, it'll keep us humble. It'll keep us anchored to the ground of reality. That he's full of love and mercy. He's sovereign. We submit to him. So what's the solution to pride? It's more of Jesus. Here's something that's incredibly powerful. Nebuchadnezzar was exalted, and he became humbled. Jesus comes humble. To, than to be exalted. I, I mentioned earlier that, that pride is us putting ourselves in God's place. Do you know what God's response to our pride is? If we're putting ourselves in God's place, God's response to our pride is that Jesus puts himself in our place. So we think we belong up there, and Jesus says, I'm coming down to where you are. I'm going to step into your life. I'm going to come into your place. Philippians 2 says this, Verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. Second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, Jesus said, you know what? I could sit here on my throne in heaven and leave you to die. And instead, he does not go, he does not sit in heaven and beat his chest. He does not count himself Uh, himself as being better than, look at verse 7, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself, the king of heaven, the king of heaven who has no sin, no weakness, no problem of his own, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, the King of heaven, humbles himself to die on a criminal's cross so we can be rescued and we can be set free from the poison of pride. Jesus chose submission and he chose humility and he chose death because that's how low God had to get to save you from the gutter of this world. Man, does that not humble us a little bit? To go, wait a second, man, here I was, all the broken pieces of my life are scattered all over the the living room floor of this world broken, and I am unable to piece it all back together. I cannot save myself. And yet the high king of heaven chooses to die in humiliation as a criminal stripped naked on the cross, shedding his blood. He chose to come all the way down here for me. You know what that'll do Monday morning when you're getting ready to go to to work and you think about that? It's going to keep both your feet planted on the ground in humility that we were broken and dying in the gutter of this world and Jesus came for us, that, that ought to humble our socks off. That Jesus is a king unlike every other king. Can I tell you how? That other kings are proud, but Jesus is humble. Other kings enslave people, but Jesus sets people free. Other kings need help. Jesus, who does not need our help, comes to help us. Other kings try to change the future, but Jesus controls the future. Other kings look down on people. Jesus came to lift us up. Other kings rule from fear. Jesus rules from love. Other kings are selfish and cruel. Jesus is sacrificial and compassionate. Other kings don't repent and they don't forgive, Jesus forgives all who repent. Other kings think they deserve worship. Jesus alone is worthy of worship. Other kings reign and then they die. Jesus died and now he reigns. At the end of human history, 
Every knee, every knee bows before this king, King Jesus. He, and the mightiest kings and queens of this world will crumble and fall down before him. When we see Jesus like that, that will humble us with joy and with hope. Here's why. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it says that he would be, he would be chopped down, but there would be a stump left. You want to know what that means? A stump with roots in the ground can grow again. Jesus crushes you and your pride. Why? So you can grow again. Nebuchadnezzar grew again. Now, was he saved here? I don't know, but it sure seems that way. He's finally kneeling before the king of heaven. Now, why didn't God tear the, the roots of the stump of Nebuchadnezzar's life up? Why didn't he do that? Because God is, God is overflowing with grace, undeserved goodness and compassion for us. That is what the Lord is doing. So, if you're like Nebuchadnezzar, uh, proud and foolish and insane, and we are, there's good news that Jesus Christ is overflowing with grace for us today. There is hope. There is healing. He died and rose again. He is inviting us to confess our pride, confess our weakness, confess our sin, to humble ourselves before him. I can't. The Bible doesn't say humble the person next to you. The Bible says you humble yourself before him. And so repentance means a change of mind. It means I agree with God. My life was doing going one way. It's, now it's a 180. I see God's ways. It's a change of heart. You can either humble yourself or you can be humbled. And we humble ourselves every day by surrender, surrendering ourselves to his leadership, surrendering ourselves to, 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 to walk in his, by his spirit, surrendering ourselves to walk in his truth, that you will have real life the way God intended in a relationship with him. You will have meaning and purpose, and you will, have ra- you will live with radical selfless love, and you, and you have a life of caring and serving others. You will have a life of deep joy and sacrificial generosity, all, all of which is incredibly fulfilling because it's how God created you to live. So there's a better life for you, and you step into that life when you surrender to Jesus and his plans in humility. He blesses the humble. So what do we do with this? We keep looking to Jesus. We keep talking to him. We keep thinking of him. We keep walking of him. Whatever problems your, your pride has caused you in life, Jesus wants to forgive and restore So living humbly before him is the only way to thrive in this Babylon. So here's the question. Will you surrender to him? Is he the Lord of your life, or are you still holding on to that title? Is it Jesus, the Savior of the world, blood bought at the cross, grave left behind in his resurrection, ascended to the throne of heaven, reigning over the universe, the galaxies? Are we going to surrender to him? Are we going to hold on to our little kingdoms here? We won't survive doing that. But if we walk in humility before Jesus, we will thrive. He will exalt you and lift you up. He will honor you, and you will live in the life that God has promised. Will you stand with me? So this morning, as we kind of bow our heads and we enter into a time of really response in our, in our hearts before the Lord, the, the question remains, and it's, am I trying to commandeer and steer and guide the direction of my life, or have I surrendered myself to Jesus? Because the truth is, if you've not surrendered yourself to Jesus, You have ample experience in seeing the letdown and disappointment of you trying to be the captain of your own fate. That nobody has let you down more than you've let yourself down. All the high hopes, all the all the all the dreams, all the things that we promised ourselves, and then life and other things got in the way, and we, and we feel dejected and we feel depleted of energy, and we don't think we can go on. That's because we have tried to live the life that God created. We're trying to live it in our own way, our own strength, and you can't do it. You can't do it. And it's broken you, and you're battered and you're tired, 
and you're frustrated and you're hurt. And there's a healer whose name is Jesus who cares deeply for you to the point of his own death cares deeply for you to the point of great suffering. The Bible says that by his wounds we are healed. He invites you into a relationship with him if you don't know him. He invites you in to experience his grace. He invites you in for friendship. He invites you in for forgiveness. You can, you can have, you can enjoy the love and the wisdom and the mercy of God in your life. But it comes by surrendering yourself to Jesus. Laying down your pride and saying, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I need you to, I tried it my way and it's not working. I need you to save me. I need you to change me. Hey, and if you're here this morning and that's the prayer, that, that's your heart, I would love to talk with you and pray with you and, 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 and tell you more about his salvation, his forgiveness, his plan for your life. You can pray right now, right where you are, as we sing in a moment. You can pray right now, and you can say, Jesus, will you save me? I repent. I, I, I need you to forgive me of my sins. And his answer to you is always yes. He will not cast you out. He will not turn you away. If you come to him with that kind of heart, he will not turn you away. If you believe in his death on the cross and his resurrection for you, you will be saved. But it takes looking up at Him. If you're here this morning and you're a believer in Jesus and you're, you're struggling, you see the ripple effects of pride in your life, there's always good news that Jesus is always redeeming. He's always at work rectifying and changing and transforming you in the mess. He's always, he's always engaged in our problems and our pain. Even if they're self-inflicted, and they often are. And so won't we just come to him now in this moment, sing and surrender and say, Lord, I believe in you, but I've gone a little wayward here. Lord, would you, would you help me? Would you, would you remind me? Would you strengthen me? Would you give me wisdom? And he will. He's a good Savior. He is, a, he is a, a brother. He is a friend to sinners and to broken people. Do you need healing? It's found in, it's found in the loving arms of Jesus. that his victory has the final say. So let's lay our burdens down before him this morning. Father, God, we thank you for everything you do for us. Lord, we're grateful for your word here. It's a hard word in Daniel 4, but we're grateful for it because we're reminded of who you are and who we are, and, and we're reminded that you love us so much that you have to break some things away in our lives and it's painful and but it's ultimately for our good and we thank you for it. Lord, we pray for this morning that if there's somebody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day they give their heart and their life to Jesus. That they would say, Lord, I need your forgiveness. That they would believe in you and Lord, that you would open their hearts and open their eyes and, and let them see the light, the grace, the truth, this new world, this new way of, 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 of living, eternal life. Lord, would you do that this morning in somebody's heart? And for, the, for us as your people, Lord, battered down by the waves and winds of this life, again, often self-inflicted, Lord, would you help us? Would you remind us that, it, that this pain is not permanent, that you're trying, to, you're trying to grow us, you're trying to change us in this. Heal us. 
So may we confess any weaknesses or sin or pride before you, Lord. And may we just find a burden-lifting freedom in you. So, Lord, as we sing, may you have your way. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I know you hurt. I can see it in your eyes. So pull back the curtain. And take off your disguise. And whoever told you it ain't worth a fight. The cross tells a story that'll change your mind. There's only Pray with me. Father, we're grateful for everything you do for us. God, we're grateful for 
your amazing love. That we were we are hard-hearted like Pharaoh. We are we are stiff-necked and rebellious, defiant, selfish. And Lord, your love for us is greater than our sin and our weakness. All the brokenness. God, you have overcome that and conquered that. You have that you have sent your son to die and, and, to, and to rise again. And Lord, it has radically changed us. So Lord, I, I pray that, that we would continue to have a, an attitude of thankfulness, an attitude of worship, that you keep, keep us in a posture of humility and that we'll grow and we'll grow. And the more that we grow and the wiser that we become, the more we see that, that it's, it's all because of you. Our lives are the sum total of your grace. Help us remember. Strengthen our faith. Keep, help us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Today and every day. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. You may be seated for a moment. Okay, so this morning we have a special opportunity to do, to do something. Uh, and so Kaiser... Uh, large is coming to be baptized. I'll let you get over there, buddy. And so before we do that and uh, before we celebrate uh, his profession of faith in Jesus, we are, have a couple of announcements to share with you. Number one, of course, uh, thank you for your generosity and your giving, offering baskets up here, drop boxes on the way out this morning, Freedom Fellowship, uh, freedomwhitepond.org forward slash give. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Second, I hope you guys enjoyed first Sunday breakfast for those who came. Okay, awesome. We're going to keep doing that. Cool. What a great time of fellowship. So that's, we, always, we always want to promote and we always enjoy more fellowship. So awesome. Thank you uh, for that. And so uh, one last thing before we get to, down to brass tacks over here, uh, that uh, uh, trunk or treats coming up at the end of the month of October. Now, we got, set, we got four Sundays. We got some time. And so, but, uh, so if you want to dress up and give out candy, there'll be opportunity to have a trunk and do that. And because we love our community, I mean, there's going to be literally a thousand people come through here. That's, that's what happens. And they walk right under the awning all the way down and we get to, they get to stop and talk to all of us. And you're saying, man, I want, I like to serve, but I don't want to dress up. I'm, that's not really my thing. Well, there'll be other opportunities for you as well, uh, to, to serve and, and, uh, and to hand out uh, warm drinks and, and uh, just to still uh, meet and, and love on people. So there'll, there'll be something for everybody. We'll have a sign-up sheet out in the coffee house for in, in weeks to come, and we're going to set up a, a, some bins for you to donate candy. So it's a great, it's a great opportunity on Halloween to, to, to love our neighbors. So, okay, if I could have turned your attention. All right, Kaiser, let's go ahead and hop up in here, buddy. I hope this water's still warm. If it's not, it's not as cold as it could be. All right. So you're young. You'll survive it. Let's do it. All right. So here we are. Kaiser Large comes this morning. And uh, several, several months ago, he had the opportunity to, uh, to give his heart, his life to Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he made that commitment to Jesus. And so this morning, we come to baptize him. Um, ba here's what we believe about baptism, for those who don't know. Baptism, we believe, is the first, is the, is the first public step of a, of a profession of faith in Jesus. And so it's, it, baptism, this water does not save you. But it, it's simply a picture saying, I'm following him. Because here's what, bad, here's what we do. When we immerse you, what happens is, is you go down into the watery grave like Jesus went down, in, down into death at the cross. And you rise back up with him to new life. It's a picture of what God has done in here. And so this morning, Kaiser comes. And uh, Kaiser, I've got one question for you, man. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yeah, all right. So based upon his profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Woo! All right. Yes, sir. So, hey, isn't God good? Amen. Amen. Yes, he is. And so, hey, we're going to pray. I'm going to let you stand with me. We're going to pray. 
We'll sing and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you again for all that you do for us. Lord, we're grateful that you're still changing hearts and lives. And we pray that you continue to, to have your way in our hearts and our lives. And we pray that as we go throughout our day, that we will constantly always surrender to you and to your will. Lord, help us, help us, help us for your glory. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, let's sing it out. There's only love in love.